it's so great to be with all of you guys who have, many of you have traveled with me on my foot in both worlds career of both trying to make change and trying to understand and study conditions. So it's really uh, wonderful to be here with people on uh, line as well as the wonderful people in the room. Um, as David said, I, I had this great opportunity to uh, study three communities in rural America now 20 years ago when I started doing interviews and then was invited to update uh, my book, Worlds Apart, and so uh, I'm sort of breaking a little preview news of what we found uh, today. But I also want to talk a little bit about the first study so that we can think from what we once saw to what's happened 20 years later. Uh, I, I like to think of rural America as consisting of four different kinds of rural. There are amenity-rich places where laptop professionals and retirees are going, and uh, where the, the challenge really, as I was talking with a, another friend today, is to not uh, see inequality, but there at least is a growth economy. And then there are transitioning places that have good natural assets, but have depended on extracting or processing those assets and not on stewarding them and making them something that people want to move and enjoy, move to and enjoy. And then there are tra uh, declining places like the Midwest, where my colleague Ken Johnson likes to say uh, that graves are outnumbering cradles and there's real decline in rural America. And then there are chronically poor places. And for many of those in the room and, and working with MDC and others, the, the chronically poor places have troubled us for many years and were a real target of the uh, war on poverty many years ago. I went back with uh, students and, and a colleague, Gemma Beckley, uh, from Russ College in Mississippi to uh, interview hundreds of people in Appalachia and the Delta. And then for contrast, we went to one of these transitioning communities up in uh, northern New England in a mill and woods dependent area. Um, we wanted to understand why poverty persists, as David says, the title of my book conveys, and what it takes to bring about community change. And I think that um, we were talking to earlier today about why America should care about rural America and rural communities. Well, one thing from a, just from a trying to understand things perspective, rural communities are a really great place to understand the dynamics of what's going on when people are poor and how they relate to people who aren't poor and how their poverty and opportunity is related to the politics of the place as well as the broader state or national politics. In those two poor communities, I found that there were basically two classes. There were haves and have-nots, and virtually no middle class. It was true in Appalachia and coal country, and it was true in the Delta, in where plantations were the basis of the economy. And my central argument was that the absence of a middle class and the divisions between these haves and have-nots was undermining the community institutions that are absolutely essential for poor people's opportunities to advance uh, and get out of poverty. Um, and, and often, you know, schools are at the, really at the heart of that. We found that the poor were socially isolated in the extreme they attended different schools, different churches, didn't have the same opportunities in recreational programs, and they were just not prepared for the mainstream, as William Julius Wilson would say. They weren't prepared for escaping poverty. And these are cases, I'm sure many of you know rural America well, where these poor socially isolated families are living maybe in a trailer right next to a, a home of a strip miner who's got a, a nice brick home, uh, but the, the social isolation is extreme. But also, and I think this is a really important piece of what we see in rural America, the local politics were corrupt. And that corruption of local politics had such an impact, not only on those institutions, but on the, the personal uh, sort of aspirations of those who were poor and, and were not part of the um, mainstream or the haves in these communities. Um, and, and when there's local corrupt politics like that, it undermines uh, community life. And so no one's really holding public officials or private employers accountable. Nobody's making sure that whatever resources there are, public or private, jobs, are being handled, handed out fairly. People look out for their own families, not for the community as a whole. 
and the haves distance themselves from the have-nots. They dress fancy, they go to these different schools and different churches. One person in Appalachia said that it was like a cliff's edge. And then there's the people who don't want to work at all, never have and never will. We call them first of the monthers because they come out of the hollers with about 10 kids and they don't wash. They just draw food stamps and stuff like that. They live like that and I guess that's the way they want to live. Or as one woman put it who was poor, there's the good rich people and the bad poor people. And we heard that a lot. In the Delta, the haves were the wealthy plantation owners. Farmers called them, uh, they were farmers to the whites and boss men to the blacks. And, and along with the white professionals and storekeepers. The Delta have nots, of course, were the poor black majority, vulnerable and dependent. One white restaurant worker said to me, if one of the blacks was to piss Jimmy off, he could make it hard on the boy, get him fired. See, over here, the blacks don't have the opportunities that whites does. They're really disgraded. Now, this is in the early 1990s. People said, really, our black middle class are those who left for the cities. There were, importantly, some middle class blacks in this community and in many other rural southern communities who owned small businesses or were teachers or principals who had some standing in the community. And sometimes they were derided by some of the more radical organizing blacks as toms, as people who were just carrying out uh, the wishes of the white community. And it's certainly true that the whites relied on many of them for, to manage their relationships with the black community. 25 years ago, 35% of the people in our coal community were poor. And poverty was 60% in this plantation community. 80% of blacks were poor. In this environment with such great poverty, family names really mattered because they identified which group you belonged to. Someone said in Appalachia, you hear someone's last name and before you meet them, you've already got the idea that they're either a good person or they're as sorry as can be. Or someone else said, you have to come from the right family around here. If you've got a rich name, they'll take you. Otherwise, you can't find work. So it's consequential names about your names. In the Delta community, the community I call Dahlia, one young man said to me, if you're colored and you got money, white people will talk to you. If you ain't got no money, all they want to hear is yes, sir, and no, sir. He went on to say how unfair that was, that people in this place couldn't help whether they were poor or not. Another thing about these communities is that everybody could name the families who run things. Like there were two to four names that always came up in the coal community, uh, local coal operators and merchants, and there were three or four plantation families that everybody named, the big farmers. Everybody knew who they were, and they were said to be able to block new businesses, to preserve their own control. Uh, they could blackball individuals. One person said, you have to be very careful here. You don't want to make enemies, because especially if you don't have importance. If they blackball you, you'll never flip a hamburger. Someone else said, the farmers will just cut you out. They'll run you out of town if you cross them. In both places, there was, were frequent examples of vote buying and of uneducated, dependent people voting as they were told. If you tried to speak up for change or you voted for the wrong faction, you could be blackballed. Not just you, but your nephew or your mom could lose a job or be transferred to a less desirable job in the school system. In the, and you might not work in the mines anymore or on the plantation once you got blackballed for raising questions about how people were being treated. This led to a place that was full of suspicion, and, and suspicion extended to those who were trying to change things and help the poor. One minister in the Delta said, everything here is segregated. There is no social interaction between the races and no trust. Whites say they can't trust blacks, and blacks say the same thing about whites. Now, the professionals in Blackwell, my coal community, sent their children to the county seat school, which was public but independent. And that school, for years, had been a school that sent kids on to, on to college. The county schools, where the have-nots went, were chaotic. Some said really dangerous. And everyone agreed that there was no learning going on in those classrooms. The public schools in Dahlia, almost 100% black, struggled with chaos and discipline when we were there. There were even cuttings. There were a lot of uh, paddlings. Students were failing miserably on the tests. Whites sent their children to a private academy and spent a lot of their time and energy, their community energy, in fundraisers to keep it going. The haves in both places attended larger congregation churches, Baptist, Presbyterian, or Methodist, 
and they were all white, of course, the, in, in the Delta. They have knots attended small churches, often with itinerant pre preachers, and always with very few resources. All the churches that we, uh, where we talked with ministers or um, people who were in the congregation were focused on saving souls, not on improving community welfare. Life was family-based and church-based, and families and churches were divided by social class, and in the case of the Delta, by race. In contrast, this transitioning place that we visited 20 years ago, the more diverse, prosperous community without that heavy weight of poverty, everybody there talked about the lack of divisions. People are either general paper, the union people who make a decent wage, or they're working class people who make a rotten wage. That's the only class distinction. They all lived the same life of sports, camps in the woods, ATVs, hunting, and fishing. One person said, there's no separation. Our kids play baseball together. They're going scouting together. And those on public assistance mostly described a lack of discrimination. And kids at the end of the road would get a new pair of uh, basketball shoes or a better coat discreetly from one of the teachers at school. Schools and churches were not divided by class. People talked about trust and cooperation, and they worked together to solve problems like high teen pregnancy or the need to upgrade the public hockey rink. When we asked people there who runs things, they gave us these puzzled looks. And then after thinking for a while, they'd name a couple of business people who invested in nonprofits in the area. People from all walks of life described being involved in community organizations and scouts or uh, sports teams. So this mill had what I call a strong civic culture. It had trust and cooperation. It had broad participation in community affairs. And there was investment in community-wide institutions, a robust public life, you might say. And we're debating a lot as a nation right now how much we want to do publicly, how much we want to do privately. As we get to more inequality, it becomes even more urgent of a discussion. So I attributed this strong civic culture to the large blue-collar middle class, as opposed to that heavy burden of poverty that we saw in the coal community in the Delta to diverse ownership of business and land. Even though there was a big mill there, there were a lot of other companies and a lot of other small businesses, as opposed to how tightly held business and land resources were in Appalachia and the Delta. And a history of respecting and valuing education and investing in community institutions, both by the old mill owners and also by ethnic-based worker organizations. Historically, as all of you know, the coal companies and the plantation owners believed that they really needed to tightly control their workers. They wanted cheap and compliant labor. They discouraged participation in community life, except for the small churches, because they feared unions in the coal fields, and they feared civil rights organizing in the Delta. They provided company stores, coal, store, coal company stores and plantation stores, and they issued credit at these stores to ensure that workers depended on them year round. When mechanization in coal and cotton dramatically reduced the need for labor, there was huge outmigration. Some who stayed had the good coal jobs or the good tractor driver jobs, but many scraped by on welfare or with help from family or pieced together odd jobs. Young people that we met from the hollows or recently off the plantation were often pretty rough. They had a distinctive way of speaking with little experience outside of their isolated small sphere of family and work life. They might come to school dirty, in hand-me-down clothes, and then they'd get looked down upon and made fun of by the other kids, and their teachers would te treat them badly. I had amazing um, conversations with some of these kids as young adults who just uh, had such a strong desire for respect and dignity and uh, suffered through this treatment in these small places. The main thing is there was just an enormous education deficit in these places that we saw vi visible when we were there 20 years ago. Let's just take a minute and think about some concepts that help us understand what we just heard about and what we're about to hear about. First, I like to use the definition of poverty that Peter Townsend uses. He's a British sociologist. You know, we, we measure poverty like my, you know, 60% of uh, Dahlia was poor by income cutoffs, which today it's a family of four, 23,000, but it's not a very good indicator of what poverty's experience is. He says, poverty is not having adequate resources to participate in the accepted ways of society. 
The poor are socially secluded in other, excluded in other way, words, marginalized and left out. And we certainly saw that in Dahlia and in Blackwell. I, I like the way Amartya Sen, who's an international development scholar, talks about uh, poverty and development. And he says that the poor are deprived of basic capabilities. They're deprived of the capacity to have good health, deprived of the cap capacity to be literate. Of course, the word deprived reminds us that those from poor families do not choose to be poorly educated or unhealthy. Uh, Amartya Sen and another development scholar, Martha Nussbaum, say that we should think about what people can do and what people can be, what they are capable of, and that supporting the development of those capabilities requires, as Nussbaum puts it, affirmative, material, and institutional support not simply, as a neoliberal agenda would say, a failure to impede, but affirmative material and institutional support. If children from families with a few resources are to achieve the American dream, they need more than a good attitude. They need adequate material and cultural resources to participate. We saw that in Blackwell and Dahlia, the poor were excluded and left to chaotic, dysfunctional schools, not hired if they had a bad name or a displeased a boss man. When I wrote Worlds Apart, I found two concepts helpful. One was culture as toolkit, not as norms or values, what people think they, uh, their um, behavior ought to be, but rather, and, and this is in a, in a period when conservatives are, are ascribing poverty to culture of poverty, to lack of ambition and bad habits that were passed on from generation to generation. But if we think about culture as toolkit, and you think about those kids from the hollers or recently off the plantation and how little they have to bring to school with them in their toolkit or to an employer, then they've been deprived by a deliberate strategy of coal companies and plantation owners to not have that cultural resource. The second concept that I found useful is the one we've already discussed, civic culture. How do communities work? How do people treat one another? What are the norms about whether we do things privately or as a whole community, as a public group? A few families controlled the economy and politics, as we saw. The have-nots were deliberately excluded in the coal community and in the plantation community, and people looked out for their own families all across the spectrum. And in Gray Mountain, where there was not this large group of poor families, and I'm emphasizing that this time, I didn't used to emphasize that. I used to emphasize the absence of the middle class, but the other side of that circle is the presence of this large group of poor families and children. So this February, I returned to these communities 20 years after I first started to visit them with two colleagues, a wonderful graduate student, Jessica Ulrich, and my colleague, Gemma Beckley, uh, from Rust College. And we wanted to see what changes had occurred and think about what those changes meant for our original conclusions and for uh, what we, all of us in this room and on the, the streaming are interested in. We talked to about 40 people in each community, including some of the people we'd interviewed before. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in each community. And what I thought I'd do is read a couple of paragraphs of my update in each place. What's going to happen is we're going to publish a little short afterward in, the, in this revision to the book. So in Blackwell, hunkering down with family. It is a crisp, cold morning in February 2013, and frost clings to the tufts of brown grass on the edge of the fast food parking lot. Nearly all the cars and trucks in line for the drive through window and parked in the lot have Friends of Coal bumper stickers. Some have Friends of Coal license plates. The bubblegum dispenser inside the door has a Friends of Coal sticker. But these Friends of Coal are facing very hard times. With recent coal mining layoffs, official unemployment in Blackwell is nearly 18% and only half of working age men are employed. Fewer than 40% of working age women are employed. One third of families have no workers. 30% of youth are idle, not in school and not working, and poverty is high. One in three are poor. Nearly 40% are relying on food stamps or SNAP. A teacher said in this visit, if you wanted to stay in Blackwell and provide for your family, you just had to go to the mines. You had to go to the mines, and as the mining jobs closed out, People began to leave, just as they did in the other great migration, and the ones that stayed behind have had to scrabble for whatever they can get. 
So this is, over these 20 years, Blackwell lost 20% of his population, an enormous loss in population. Coal production is down just as 30% in just the last year because the seams are harder to reach in this part of Appalachia and because there's serious competition from natural gas. Jobs were scarce in the 1990s, but they're even scarcer. Everybody talks about coal is all there is. Outside interests came in to promote this friends of coal business, kind of polarizing the community in the way that uh, they used to be polarized in the bloody union struggles. You're for us or against us. If you're for coal, you oppose the Obama administration and the EPA, and you want support for coal industry, not regulations. If you're against Blackwell's coal economy, you're talking about economic transition away from coal, or some would say after coal, to greener, tourism-based economic activity. And indeed, there are embryonic efforts to develop recreation activities. There's an ATV park, a zip line, horseback riding. Some say the rivers are cleaner and the bass is back. People say hunting is good and you can get elk and bear. But scarce jobs is the chief refrain. Coal is all there is. Some who have skills do 312s as nurses or welders or electricians in distant cities and come back home for the other four days. You still hear about the bad poor families who draw rather than work. We even heard the same story over and over again about the little boy who's asked what he wants to do when he grows up and they say he says he wants to draw. Same story. Temporary assistance to need, needy families, TANF, as you all know, has replaced a AFDC. And its time restrictions mean that there are only a few families still relying on welfare in Blackwell. Therefore, those who do not work or do not have enough work to support their families rely on SNAP, perhaps disability, maybe a family member's pension or other check, and Medicaid. Many relate this lack of jobs in 2013 to an extraordinary painkiller addiction that has swept through Blackwell. And it's affected the have-nots and the haves. When a teacher asks how many know someone struggling with addiction, every student raises a hand. Every family law case, a lawyer told us, involves painkiller addiction. And now a family with a felon is the family with a bad name who can't get a job. My dad was a drug addict, and he stayed in trouble all the time, in and out of prison. My big brother was the same way, and my little brother's starting. Anyway. When I would try to get a reserve something in my last name, a hair appointment, or even a doctor's office, I couldn't do it. They just would not take me. Another young man with good plumbing skills described the impact drugs and a felony conviction had on him. I had drugs take everything I ever loved in my whole life away from me. My home, my truck, my bass boat, my four-wheeler, my guns, everything. And now I'm a convicted felon, and I can't own a gun. I destroyed my family's name, and I can't get a job anywhere. So for Blackwell, the two big changes 20 years later is this ongoing steep decline in jobs and the related out-migration and a devastating, pervasive painkiller addiction problem. Importantly, and maybe not surprisingly, because the economy is stagnant and more people are moving out and not in, the same <coughs> families run things, although it's the next generation in the case of the Cole family. People say they still call the shots to advance their own interests and still keep new business out. And we had several examples. You still don't want to cross them. If they fire you, you will never work in the county again. There's a lot of politics here. If someone does not like you, you cannot get ahead and you have to leave. It's the same families. It's just a different generation. Politics may be less corrupt. It's kind of hard to tell. The county judge and some magistrates seem genuinely acting to improve public welfare. But I could tell you some newspaper accounts that would suggest there's a lot of chaos in the political system. The county seat schools continue to serve professional families, sending their kids on to college. There are still reports of patronage at the county schools, jobs and contracts going to family and political backers of school board members. But the county schools are doing better, partly because of statewide education reform. The several high schools have consolidated a familiar rural story into one in a very fancy complex, and that's reduced some of the rivalries and fighting that had spilled over into the communities, and it's made for more competitive statewide football and basketball teams in this sports-loving community. Graduation rates are up overall. The larger regional community college has become a very important anchor institution, offering adults, especially moms with young kids, chances, a second chance to get skills and try to get work. 
they do nursing and hospital jobs and also a big mining complex and are just starting a mortician school. It's got a great arts program that's been really important to a lot of young people in the, in the region. But the bottom line is that jobs are very hard to come by in Blackwell and people are leaving. The failed civic leadership of 20 years ago is still in place. And those who stay are hunkering down with family, some trapped by drug addiction, needing parents and more and more often grandparents to help take care of the kids or put food on the table, and others are just plain committed to family ties, one of the great strengths of rural America. Let me move to Gray Mountain, the mill town up north, holding on to a blue collar community. The snow is starting to fall as we creep down the last steep hill into Gray Mountain and make our way through town on this early March morning. Unlike 20 years ago, the air looks and smells clean. The rotten egg smell that characterized the mill town 20 years ago is gone. After a series of owners and repeated shutdowns and reopenings, the large paper and pulp mill in the heart of town closed for good in the mid-2000s. And when it closed, someone said, there were still six or 700 jobs and those disappeared. The heart of Gray Mountain was that pulp and paper mill that was there and that was devastating. The community understood how permanent this time it was this time because the owner dismantled it completely to avoid competition with another mill that they owned. But they saved one boiler, one valuable boiler. Remember this mill site is right in the middle of town. A, a developer had persuaded them. That boiler became the focus of a wrenching debate about the identity of Gray Mountain. There were some, including the mayor and the council members at the time, who wanted to change the area's Im image. When the mill closed and the smell was gone, it was a chance to rebuild Gray Mountain away from an industrial place and emphasize the natural beauty. The town seal was changed to take the smokestacks out, and people were urging their neighbors to back Riverside development. But as the national economy got worse with our recent Great Recession, sentiment shifted towards those who were saying that Gray Mountain was a working city, and they proposed that the remaining boiler be converted to that biomass plant. Developing a new ecotourism identity faced too many obstacles. There were dams on the river. There was a Superfund site from the previous mill. People said there were struggles, there were meetings, there were close calls, but after a lot of work getting permits and funding, they moved forward. And when we drove in that uh, Monday morning, there was a huge construction site with hundreds of workers building this biomass plant. It'll provide 40 good jobs and then other jobs in the woods. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether there's the wood supply for this biomass plant, but it's a big statement. In the past two, a few years, since when we, right before we arrived, they lost two important manufacturing jobs that had been really good citizens and good to their workers, so moral, morale was really low. But they have two prisons, like much of rural America, a state prison that's hired a lot of the former mill workers, and a federal prison where, interestingly, you have to be 35 or under to get hired on, and so it's bringing young families in. There's an in ambitious ATV and snowmobile project, miles and miles of trails, not unlike Blackwell. There's some ongoing tensions about environmental protection, but not the same vitriol that we found in Blackwell. Locals mainly still want access and bristle when a gate goes up. But one really important change besides the closing of the mill is that when those housing values went down, a lot of poor people moved into this blue collar community. Uh, people dependent on public assistance, bringing Section 8 vouchers and looking for cheaper housing. Gray Mountain people thought they were sent by either landlords who owned property in both Gray Mountain and in other cities in the region, or maybe even by social service people who were trying to help them stretch their dollars. Whatever the reason, it was clear to the people in Gray Mountain that these neighborhoods that had been double and triple decker, I don't know if you're familiar with those, that kind of housing in northern New England, that had housed multi-generations of blue-collar families were now turning into troubled neighborhoods with lots of uh, poor people. Everybody worried about it. One person said, they come here and they sleep all day and raise hell all night. They have children who are a product of that lifestyle. They get coded in your school system. We were spending eighty to $100,000 per kid because these kids had learning disabilities because of the way they were brought up. It wasn't just a threat. The situation was real. We're cleaning up the mess. Those people aren't welcome here. It's my place with the great civic culture. Gray Mountain hired a housing director and worked on enforcing regulations. They held landlords accountable and invested money in taking them down the houses that were beyond repair. 
They established a housing company to fix up the bad housing that could be fixed up. So in effect, they turned the tide against neighborhood deterioration. And so in a lot of ways, they chose to stay both blue collar and middle class. They put that biomass plant right in the middle of the town. They invested in ATV trails, and they let those vehicles come right into the town. And they took down the bad housing to avoid the blight. So nobody really likes the idea of a prison economy, but they by and large appreciate the jobs for the laid off mill workers and the fact that these new families are coming in. Interestingly, community partition, par participation is still very much the norm. People described how their father and their uncles coached teams and were involved in uh, hockey and Boy Scouts and that they were doing the same thing and the young people were doing the same thing. And even though there was widespread criticism of the new poor families and the burden that they were putting on the police and on the schools, the children of the poor families who stayed appear to have been wrapped into the school system and provided services in schools and clinics. We've been able, one provider said, to sit around the table and say, what services are being offered? Where are the gaps? We all work together, so no matter what door you enter, there's no wrong door in Gray Mountain. So Gray Mountain is adjusting to a new economy and new demographics. Most of the good jobs are gone, and in the last decade, number of young adults in their 20s and 30s has declined by 30%. They can't keep a chain grocery store. They can't attract a Home Depot. Downtown revitalization groups were happy to see a dollar store come in. But while Blackwell, the coal place, has lost so many jobs and families over the years, Gray Mountain's overall employment and population numbers are about the same. Blackwell's future with coal in decline, with high poverty and dependency, with little civic leadership looks dim. The weight of poverty and the lack of jobs define the region. There may be some hope in young people interested in sustainable efforts and in these recreation uh, programs, the people at the college, but overall with that painkiller addiction and the lack of jobs, it seemed very sad. Gray Mountain with only 12% in poverty, not one third, and with its civic culture intact, is making a transition to a new economy, a lot less vibrant, but stable. And I think it probably represents a lot of change in a lot of rural America. So the Dahlia chapter is written with Gemma Beckley. These days, when you drive down Highway 44 from the nearest airport to Dahlia, you still travel through large, flat expanses of cotton, soy, and rice fields. The big farmers, who have received over $188 million in crop subsidies since we were last here, now flood their fields in the winter to attract duck hunters, and the low water shimmers on this gray winter morning. There are rumors that the business leaders who make up the powerful regional commission want to turn more of the Yazoo Delta into hunting preserves and retirement developments, catering to upper-income upper whites. And indeed, we saw uncultivated stretches of low shrubs and trees to attract wildlife for hunters. There have never been workers in the fields in February when even tractor drivers were idle and relied on public assistance. But now locals tell us even in the heart of the growing season, you don't see the cotton chopping crews with their hose at going at the weeds or the, and their water jugs because of new pesticide resistant crops that mean farmers can control the weeds with pesticides. Plantation owners were tearing down tenant shacks 20 years ago so they wouldn't be responsible for elderly field workers and now there are none to be seen. The flat brown fields stretch out in all directions just as they did in the 90s with the same sprinklers idle on the edges of the field. But the road is now four lanes to accommodate visitors to the mirage-like clusters of huge casino operations that emerge from the fields in the western part of the county. There are neon lights flashing glitz, billboards advertising coming performers, and special deals for seniors on the otherwise barren agricultural landscape covered with last season's stocks. Dahlia and its surrounding communities have become one of the country's largest gambling destinations, providing employment for locals and others from nearby towns and attracting gamblers from the three-state three region. Billions of dollars in revenue has poured into our poor Dahlia community over the last 18 years, into roads, public infrastructure, public sector employees, and taxes were cut to almost nothing. So the impact of the casinos has been profound and very complex. At first, the casinos hired widely. They needed dealers and bartenders for the games, but they also needed housekeepers and dishwashers. And one of the organizers we talked to before said they hired a tremendous amount of people from Dahlia when they first got here. They could gain employment, but keep it? How is it possible for people who have worked in the catfish industry or 
in agriculture doing flat out farm labor to maintain a job like that without any training. There was no way our people could be successful. Black leaders said that the potential workers, that their cultural resources were such, they didn't know to bathe, they didn't know not to dip snuff, they didn't know to call when their child was sick or they'd missed a ride and weren't going to get to work. Those who hold jobs have kind of settled in. Many of them live in a nearby county where there's better housing and better schools and not this weight of poverty. But what about all the revenue? Well, there have been really big public sector investments, at first controlled by whites, largely for whites. A regional airport, a museum, a huge arena to host events like horse shows and draw in tourists. There's also a big new county administration building and a new jail, and police cars are everywhere. Importantly, there's a large recreation center with courts and swimming pool. After years of trying to persuade the white leadership to put some of that money into public schools, the black leaders had to organize and hire a, layer, a lawyer to push that investment. So some of the organizers said, we never could sit at the table with the white to make our community better. We could have had one of the best high schools, the best hospitals, but they just won't do it with us. And they point to the black neighborhoods that we visited 20 years ago, where poor black families still live in dilapidated homes without good sewer or water, where teens are still hanging out on corners and stray dogs roam in packs. If the intentions were to improve the quality of life for all of the citizens, when we first got this money, when you came back here, Old Town wouldn't be looking like that. You understand what I'm saying? But, and here's the really big change in Dahlia, just in the last year, the political leadership in Dahlia switched. A year ago, five blacks were elected to make up the powerful county board of supervisors. There had been one and then two black supervisors, but most people saw those supervisors as under the sway of the three white supervisors. Of course, they were the minority also. There have been a number of factors that contribute to this change. Partly, the casino employers have diluted the heavy-handed power that we saw of the plantation bossmen. As my colleague Gemma says, people have options. The leading white farmers, of course, made sure they benefited from selling the land, from the airport, and owners of small businesses are still working like in Blackwell to keep a Walmart from coming in and preserve their, uh, business, uh, their business. But the new economic opportunities have freed Dahlia workers from the tight control of farmers. Voters, especially younger voters who never worked on a plantation, can choose leaders without fear of retribution. The new black politicians worked through the churches somewhat and built some momentum. Black political leaders in the state mentored and counseled them deliberately. Explicitly taking a page out of Obama's campaign book, local blacks organized in the last election, registered new voters in a grassroots effort, and built on the turnout of the president's campaign that the tr president's campaign was generating in the black community. Dahlia also, very importantly, decisively elected a new young superintendent who seems genuinely committed to improving public education and effectively uh, preparing the students of Dahlia. The farmers still have huge assets, but African Americans now govern the public sector. There's talk and some census evidence of white flight. Maybe someone said when they saw the change coming. There's more integration than 20 years ago in the local diner, and there are more black families in the county seat. Some black leaders say the new generation of farmers has the same attitudes toward the black community as their fathers did. And we did talk to whites who used the same derogatory phrases we'd heard 20 years ago to describe and explain high teenage pregnancy rates. A volunteer coach at the rec center said, you know, I just don't see whites that often. When we were here 20 years ago, blacks and whites alike were worried about the young people, the borderline kids, as one black leader said. And there was a group of black men organizing together against the odds to get young people involved in productive activities, away from drugs and crime, and no longer fighting. They spent a lot of time building and coaching teams. The Recreation Center represents a significant answer to those organizers' dreams, a large, well-staffed complex with basketball courts, fields, and an aquatic center, and programs like Boys and Girls Club or Dahlia Teens in Action. Some hope that it would be a place where whites and blacks have, would come together, but today few whites use the facility. In some ways, the Recreation Center is like the jobs at the casino. It's really great for those who can take advantage of the opportunity new workers who have that cultural toolkit they need, children whose parents or grandmother or auntie spend, go to small churches where the word is spread about the center's program and who can help find those small fees and get transportation arranged, 
Just as there are those who cannot keep work without substantial support, there are children in fragile, often chaotic families who are not reached, who need transportation and scholarships. One said, if a mother is working and she got four kids, she can't participate. We gotta transport those kids to keep them out of trouble. For children, you really have to go and get them. When we were there in 2013 this winter, their casinos faced a serious downturn. They'd laid people off and the revenue was down 30% in the last three years, just as Dahlia's new Board of Supervisors is taking up the reins. They had to raise county taxes 30%. Unemployment is almost 20% now. Um, and of course, that's counting the people who are looking for work, as you know. Um, so it's a mixed picture in Dahlia. You have now two-thirds of men working, 60% of working age women in the labor force. Leaders are still worrying about latchkey kids getting in trouble and worst of all, dropping out of school. The high school where over 85% qualify for free or reduced lunch has a 50% dropout rate. And teen pregnancy is high with children raising children. In the mid 90s when, we wrote, when I wrote Worlds Apart, we speculated that the new professional African American return migrants might make a real change in Dahlia. They might work with the black leaders in the business sector and with the organizers, and we wondered if a new civic culture might emerge with this growing black middle class, whether we might see more cooperation and efforts to improve things for Dahlia's poor. When community affairs were run by and for white planters, black workers were excluded from all but the most menial, menial jobs, and schools failed black children. But politics and control have changed in Dahlia and the black organizers and longtime business leaders seem to be cooperating, both with each other and with a new, younger leadership who are ready to take the reins. We think three key factors underlie this political, underlie this political change. First, that long-term grassroots organizing and mentoring that committed community organizers were doing 20 years ago, 30 years ago, is paying off. Second, the deliberate nurturing of young black politicians by statewide leaders is paying off. And finally, the economic freedom that blacks now enjoy is evident at the voting booths. So the political dimension, which you in North Carolina know very well, of poverty and development is starkly visible in Dahlia, where once whites held all the power and were able to deprive African Americans from having opportunities. Those who were pushed by parents or grandparents or teachers left, and then they weren't in any trouble. They wouldn't. Uh, mess with the status quo. But as one black leader noted in this visit we just made, whites did not anticipate return migration, nor did they foresee the powerful political change that would come with new job opportunities at the casinos. Or maybe they saw it, but they thought they could prevent it. It seems possible to us that these new black leaders on the board and in the school are truly focused on building opportunity for blacks in Dahlia, and not only blacks with good family names, and stable homes, but all blacks. And once again, the schools are ground zero. Now when I wrote, I'm just gonna close with a couple of policy thoughts. When I wrote Worlds Apart 20 years ago, I concluded that even if we couldn't get Americans to support policies that would reduce poverty and inequality, we should go all out to push to make the schools work in poor communities. Today, we still have the same policy choices to make about poverty and inequality. We still have the same public debates about the extent to which policy, policy should support public goods and institutions or leave things to the private sector, most visible in the school reform debates. You are living those debates here in North Carolina. The remarkable, remarkable commitment to broad equal education that David mentioned was embodied in the North Carolina Fund that was the seed for MDC itself is being challenged. Poverty is political, as your friend Bob Korstad said in his <coughs> book about that fund. I think we know more today about what works for poor, fragile families. Quality, early childhood education makes a dif big difference, and these black organizers were talking about it. Decent, supportive schools with high expectations can give children the opportunity to get ahead. And these black organizers knew about it and had taken school people to other areas in the Midwest where integrated schools work for everyone. We know mentoring expands young people's toolkit and aspirations. And we know from the Hope, uh, New Hope Project and others that support for parents, mental health, parenting help, workforce support, makes it possible for poor adults to find some stability and that that stability then shows up and pays off for the kids. 
We know these institutional supports, remember Martha Nussbaum, are effective in building children and families' capacity to escape poverty. And we even know that there's a good return on investment, but we don't do it. Investing in poor children and families is a political decision at the local level as well as at the national level. Maybe Dahlia, with casino revenue still flowing and these new civic-minded leaders, can invest in their poor families and use some of the programs that work. But definitely, it should be a national priority. So thank you very much.